Okay. Um, hi, I think that's it. I think everyone should be able to see now. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the BenQ webinar on visualizing data. My name is Adam Softley. Um, I um, am from the design agency SNR. Um, we work within uh, data visualization, work with infographics, editorial design, um, brand. Um, so this is one of my uh, favorite subjects, if you like. Um, so I'm going to just talk to you a bit. It's, it's kind of top line about what is data visualization and, and how to use it. Um, so just to kind of give you a bit of an idea about uh, what we do as an agency here, um, I'm just going to show you some work. Now, unfortunately, um, our website is currently in development, so it's not um, up and running at the moment. But I'm just going to flick over to uh, our, our Behance page that we have, because this will just kind of give you a bit of an idea about the type of projects um, that we work on. Um, so you can see it's just from these, these thumbnails. It's not just uh, data bits that we work on. There's lots of editorial projects as well. But what we find is um, these go sort of hand in hand, editorial and data visualization go hand, hand in hand. Um, so there's lots of projects you'll see um like that now there's also ones like if i go into here for example as this is a benq webinar i thought i would just get this up and there's things like even product reviews so this is this is a product review we've done for uh their 32 inch um screen that we use here the uh the pd 3200u which is a fantastic 4k monitor um so you can sort of see anything from editorial design through to these types of infographics, um, which is not even sort of data as such. It's more of a sort of a story here. Um, so there's projects like that. If I if I uh, go back a bit, um, lots of illustration we do as well. And these are the sort of things we'll be talking about today. Sort of you know how we we come to. Um, choosing these sort of data sets, so similar like these projects here, um, and how to use it. So, can I just go back to uh, the presentation as well? So, um, what we will be running through today, uh, so is what is data visualization? So we will look at um, what are the differences between data visualization and infographics. Um, we will be looking at why we should use them as well, um, why they're such a powerful uh, form of communication. Um, we'll also look at some misleading visualizations as well. Um, also, how to represent your data, uh, the types of types of charts that there there are, and we'll look at a few of those and the, the pros and cons with those, and when to use and when not to use, um, and then best practices as well. Um, so, if I um, if I'll go through now, so so data visualization and infographics is data visualized in a way where you can clearly see stories and trends. Um, and really, what what it is, this this is, it doesn't have to necessarily have data points. So if I show something like you see here, there's actually no data points. But what you can see is that there's this clear trend. And as you go to sort of from the the second half. To the you know to the, to the to the last quarter you've got this big spike so even without um, actually any data it gives you an idea of of what's happening and this is why this is so so powerful um, also there's there's things that we we understand so you know the, the up arrow the down arrow the, there's the color that, that's being used as well so it is so visual you don't have to read anything so this is why this is so powerful. It's also a global visual language. And um, what I mean by that is people understand uh, bar charts and pie charts, and you know they understand different sizes, um, different volumes of things, and how to read it. So this is something which you know is this global language that anyone can clearly see. Um, and it's great. And in the world we live in now, with everything being so uh, fast, with everyone sort of swiping on their iPads and any any you know news stories or whatever it is, it's great having the, these visual cues such as data visualizations or or infographics. 
Now I've put this in here. This is a this is a resource which um, the FT have, and I take down this uh, this URL because um, it is a really good source. So ft.com forward slash vocabulary. Now this this here um, it gives you a bit of an idea of depending on the type of data you've got or what you want it to do. It gives you a, an idea of what options you have with regards to charts. Now it's not something that I'm going to go into and we will be looking at a few of these but there's quite a lot there but this is I thought I'd put this in because it's a really good resource so um, you know if you're you're looking at correlation between things or ranking or it, you know parts to whole then you can you can use this and it will give you the options that you want so that's ft.com for slash vocabulary um, so a really good resource free resource from from the FT so the questions often asked are, um, isn't using just standard charts um, quite limiting with your creative options? Now, um, one thing years ago when I first got into data visualization, it was it was because I was looking at these these beautiful visualizations. They were they were great. They were a piece of art. Um, and then the, the sort of closer I got to them when I was looking at them, I realized, you know, some of the, sometimes these things can take, you know, five, 10 minutes to, to look at and to read. And I think if there's a, you know, a poster or something, that's fantastic. But, you know, the world that, that I live in and working with, sort of, you know, with brand and marketing and just everything so fast, then we need something that people do understand. So it comes back to that global language again. So I think what, what, what I'd like to get across here is, you know, pie charts, bar charts, line graphs, all of these, they they are great and they're great to use. And I don't think it, it does limit your creative options. It's about how you use them. So just to give you some examples, this is a piece that, that we did. And this is just a simple um, bar chart that you see here. And obviously it's just, it's, it's integrated with an illustration and around the editorial, but you see as it goes up. So it, it is just a bar chart, that's all it is, but it's just been used in a slightly different way. Um, again, looking at these here, now this left and right, they're exactly the same data sets. And again, it's just a bar chart. So what you, what you have here, it's on the left, it's just broken up in a different way and sort of with these semicircles. And then on the right hand side, um, you've got it in sort of this 360 degree circular chart. Um, but it's just showing you can get creative with it. It's, it's not limiting. So I think you just, you choose what charts you're going to, use you're going to choose a chart that people understand and then it's up to the creative really to to really you know get get it visualized in a way that's engaging um it's also simple ways like this where you can see you know here on the on the left hand side with the coins showing showing the money or the or the battery showing energy here or even thumbs up and thumbs down or people um so there's lots of fun ways that you can do it similar here pie charts within the within the watches um, so yeah, so get creative with it, but you know, it, it's about using that format of charts that people really do, do already understand. Um, and again, just another example here, even just with, with a map as well. So what are the difference between data visualizations and infographics? Now, um, I think that lots of people have different answers to this really. The way, um, we look at it here is a uh, data visualization is um, it's a single data set so it, it's it's something like for example like here again we've got some we've got a single data set on the left hand side it's not an infographic it's integrated again with some editorial but it is just one single data set um, whereas if we're talking infographics then I would say that's that's lots of single data sets that kind of make a story so again just to give you some um, some examples again this is a data visualization because it's one data set but it's it's done in an engaging way whereas something like these two dashboards here you'll see that they are single data visualizations but they're put together to make a story or a summary um, so these are what we would call infographics so that's the difference between the two really is um, one is the single data set and an infographic is where you have those data sets together to create to create the story um, and again here's another example of you know the, the editorial um, with an inf with an infographic as well and those different data sets 
Um, now this one here, again, this is this is more of what I would call an infographic, but there's not actually any data that you see here. So just to scroll down a bit, but what we've done here, we've pulled out a, a bit of the, you know, what's within the text, but this is an illustration to accompany it. So it's still an information graphic. It's it's still talking of it showing a visual um, representation of what the what the copy is. So again, anyone that's looking at this quite quickly can look at it and get an idea of what the copy is without actually having to read it. So why do we use infographics? What, what are they for? So we use them to communicate complex stories and to share knowledge. We use them to locate and visualize problems and help find solutions to comprehend complex information visually, making it in, in intelligible, quickly and effective to understand, and to identify relationships and patterns quickly, and to represent statistical data in a visual form, and also to um, pinpoint emerging trends as well. So now this is been around for, for years, you know, even from, um, you know, going back as far as cave paintings, really. Um, but I've just put a few examples here just so you can see sort of the early days. And although this one on the left is a, is a, a little bit gross with the urine wheel, um, it actually is a great visualisation on how it was used to diagnose disease based on, on the colour of this wheel. Um, same in sort of 1640 with this chart, which was used by sailors um, to navigate across the seas and to locate harbours. Um, and then you've got William Playfair here um, with the, the bars and pie charts. Now, William Playfair was actually said to be the, uh, the inventor of the, the, the bar chart and the pie chart. Um, so this is some, some that is done here in the 17th century. Um, and then you've got this one here on the, the left, which actually showed the, the cholera outbreaks in London. Um, and what John Snow did here in 1854 is actually is basically just created a bar chart in the areas of where these outbreaks were. So you could see um, where it was all happening. And then on the right hand side here, this is quite a famous one, the, the Nightingale chart by, you know, by Florence Nightingale. Um, that shows how many people have died in the army in the East. So, um, you know, these did visualizations, although it's kind of at the, at the moment, we're sort of, there's data visualization and infographics all around us. And they have been around a long time. And it, it's, you know, there's such a great um, way of communicating uh, complex stories. So why is it so powerful? So there's two answers to this really. Um, the first would be because we understand them cognitively and emotionally. Now, cognitively, they uh, graphics speed up and increase our level of communication. Um, they also increase comprehension and recollection and also retention as well. We, 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 we remember a lot more as well with, with, uh, with graphics. Um, graphical clues also help us decode text and attract attention to information. And they also direct the reader's attention, um, increasing the likelihood that they will remember. Um, and now emotionally as well, pictures affect our emotions and our attitudes. Um, so again, it's great to have graphics there where you can tap into that. And graphics also engage our imagination and heighten our creative thinking by stimulating areas of the brain, which in turn lead to a more profound and accurate understanding of the presented material. So that leads me into sort of the, the second part of this where we, we remember graphics because they are processed in our long term memory. Now there's this quote um, that Dr. Lionel Burmark said, which I really like, which is unless words, concepts, ideas are hooked onto an image, they'll go in one ear, sail through the brain and go out the other ear. Words are processed by our short term memory where we can only retain about seven bits of information. Images, on the other hand, go directly into our long-term memory where they are remembered. So, you know, that's a, that's a great quote that, that, that shows, you know, graphics are the ones that you remember as opposed to words. Now, just to, re just to support that statement, um, what we've done here, if I give you a text description of something, so for example, a curved line with every point equal distance from a center. Now, 
remembering you know that paragraph of text is not going to be as easy or simple as the graphic description which is obviously just a circle or again if it was a polygon with four edges all of equal adjoining angles in that text description the graphic description a square so you can connect with it a lot easier so also just you know just some some um, some facts here just visual content is 40 times more likely to be shared on social media networks now everything these days is really visual and everyone's going to it from you know from video um, to these sort of these quick infographics and text is becoming less and less now in the, in the world we live in also content with visuals gets 94 percent more views than text alone as well so they are great to use so there's also the side of using data where um, at times people have used it for uh, misleading information as well um, so just to give you an example now i'm not saying this is necessarily you know on purpose it this can be a genuine mistake and mistakes do do happen um, but you do see at times things like we've got the exit polls here from 2017 where if you can have a look at this data, we've got 314 at the top here, dropping down to 266. Then we're not dropping that far to get right the way down to 34. And then 14 again is a small drop with 22, which should be up here kind of all the way down here. So for someone who wasn't really reading the numbers and going back to what I was saying at the beginning of this presentation, where, you know, you it, you, it, some, you understand it without actually having to read the numbers, this can be very misleading. So this one, for example, should have in fact looked um, more, like, more like this here on the left. Um, so very different. There's also, um, you've got to let the data sort of speak for itself. There, you know, it's nice to get really creative as we saw earlier with some of the data. But also we've got to understand that um, that it does tell those right stories. So, for example, here having this three-dimensional uh, bar chart that you've got here, there's questions around, you know, where is zero point? Where does it start? Is it, you know, is it on the same plane or is it on different? So, for example, if if I pull up a, a bar bar chart with the same data, which is just flat on, you can see these numbers are. They're very close. So looking on the left-hand side, it's very hard to determine what's bigger or smaller. Um, so just when you're looking at your data and thinking about ways creatively, um, if it is important for you to see clear differences, such as you know, which which often you do when you're using something like a bar chart, just think about the the best ways that you'll visualize that. Because if it's going to be something like we have here on the left, it it may not um, get the point across that you're that you're after. So, if, so again, something like we have here, uh, three-dimensional, A and B are quite similar in size, so it's difficult at first glance to really see what's the biggest and the smallest. So, looking at you know how it is front on on the, the flat view, then it would look something like that, and you can clearly see A is uh, bigger than than B. So how to represent your data. So now if there's anything um, anyone can take away from this webinar today, this would be the one thing that I would, I would say to, to really to pay attention to, and this is adding context. Now, um, with our clients, so many times we get data sets and, and clients are so close to their data they talk about big numbers or small numbers, and it means you know everything to them, but actually to their audience, without any context, they don't really know um, what the full story is. So to give you uh, an example of that, if we say, for example, in 2008, Goldman Sachs had a total net revenue of 22.2 million, um, which, I mean, to me, 22.2 million dollars sounds like a, a huge amount of money. So if we just visualize that, there we go. Um, so that that's great. So, you know, without knowing anything, I'll go, okay, $22.2 million, that's a, that's a big number. 
Now, it's not until we add context we really see the bigger picture. So if we had the previous year, they were at 45.9 million. So it isn't until you add that context that that big picture becomes clear. And obviously you can, you can do that with more and more data sets. Um, so as I said, if there's anything, you know, when looking at your data, really think about the context around it as well. It's not just about displaying the numbers of today, it's of yesterday or even projections as well. It's also about finding the right story within your data. Now, there's, there's no real rules about how to read data and sometimes you can just keep going and keep going and find lots of different stories. Um, but it's to, it's to try and really just pull out as, you know, as much as you can really to give a true, um, to give a sort of a truth to the data that, that's there. So to give you an example, if we say, there's, we've got two people here, we've got Alex and Rachel, and we talk about um, the biscuits that Alex and Rachel has eaten. So Alex has eaten two biscuits and Rachel has eaten six biscuits. So if we visualize that, we can see uh, Rachel has eaten three times more biscuits than Alex. So that's kind of one data set, if you like. Um, and there's a truth in that because that's exactly what has happened. That is how many biscuits they've eaten. But it's when we sort of we dig a bit deeper into the story to try and add, it's, it's not really context, but it's just to try and add another layer to it. So if we say, for example, well, Alex and Rachel, they both weigh the same. So they're both at 65 kilograms, for example. And um, Alex has eaten two biscuits, as we know, Rachel has eaten six. But Alex has actually run one mile, let's say, that week. Um, but Rachel has run 10 miles that week. So if we look at biscuits per mile, Alex has actually had two, whereas Rachel has 0 0.66. So again, if you look at, if you look at the bottom here, before where Rachel was much bigger, now Alex is much bigger. So it's not until you really dig deeper and, and understand the story to, to get the best out of the data and the story that you're trying to tell. So um, defining your audience as well. This is this is um, very important as well. It's knowing, you know, it's the positioning of your infographic. Um, so I'm going to give a, a, an example here of something we, we did a while ago, um, which was an infographic for a client, which was about compound interest. Um, now, the brief for this was uh, it had to be on brand, which is fine. Um, they wanted it to uh, not take too long to read. Um, and, and more importantly, had to be uh, had to be shareable as well. And the audience was between 25 and 40 years old. Now, when we saw this content, it's like, okay, now to make compound interest exciting for it to be, become a shareable bit of content is quite difficult. So. This was kind of the content that was given, which is fine. So as you go through, it talks about what compound interest is, and there's a nice chart that shows how it sort of stacks up over time. Um, it compares it to simple interest that you see sort of down the bottom here. As you scroll down, they then wanted this equation in there, um, which um, is probably not the most engaging thing for a lot of people to have, have in there. Um, and sort of it goes down, but it's there's nothing there that's really pulling their audience in or defining their audience. So we kind of had to think about it and thought, well, you know, how are we going to sort of turn this on its head? If this is to be a shareable content, how how are we going to reach that audience of 25 to 40 year olds? So what we did is we created this new headline, how compound interest can help you afford a mortgage, a sports car or save for a pension. So straight away, by putting these these three items, a house up there for 25,000, a sports car for 45,000, um, and 200,000 for, for the pension, it, it gives you something that people can instantly relate to. So again, as you go through, there's not much here that's different. You've still got the, the, the showing how compound interest works. As you scroll down, what we did then is we, we just did this line graph and on that line graph, we plotted how long it would take for you to uh, save with compound interest and with simple interest and with no interest 
um, for these three things. So you can see, you know, you've got a mortgage here quite low with compound interest, whereas with no interest at all, you know, it's years and years later. So this is just something that's really quick and visual and instantly you're connecting with your audience. Um, and then again, as you go, go down, it's just quite simple. It just keeps talking about these three things. So it's not overcomplicating um, the story. Um, so connecting with your audience, um, if you can really think about ways you're going to do that, it's going to really help your, your infographic or your visualization. So organizing your data. Um, so there, there's, there's a, a way that you can organize um, your data known as LAPS. So Richard Sol Warman, who's a graphic designer and architect and the founder of TED, um, came up with this, this LAPS, this way to organize information. So he was saying that you do it by, by location, by alphabet, by time, by category, or by hierarchy. So if we sort of drill down into each of them, so if we start with location, and then we, we have we use these buildings here um, as an example. So the way that we can categorize these buildings is by location. So we can literally say where, and you can see here how it's plotted on where they are in, in the world. And also we've got it pulled out here as well. Um, so location is a great way of categorizing things. There, you could also, moving on, you could, you could um, categorize them alphabetically. So here, again, you can see that we've, we've, we've done it starting with the Burj Khalifa going down to the Shard in London. You can see that it, it's going through the alphabet um, and categorizing it in that way. And what's nice about if, if we did it that way, um, at times it can give you, it can give you nice random uh, spikes with your data. It's not in this order of, you know, high to low, um, but actually there, there is a, it does make sense. It, there's still logic there for why it's that way. It's not just random. There's time as well. So great for things like timelines. Um, so you can see here the different dates in which the buildings were um, completed. And then you've got category as well. So um, for here, we'll just go tall, super tall or mega tall. So you can categorize the buildings as well. Um, and there's lots of different ways that you can categorize things here. We've, this is what we've used, these three things, this tall, super tall, mega tall. Um, and then going into the final one is hierarchy as well. So here we're just looking at the, uh, the tallest to the shortest. So it's, it's it, it, the way you categorize these is, you know, it just depends on what the story is that you want to um, show, really. Um, but it just goes to show, you know, there is many different ways in which you can display your data. So um, types of charts. Now, um, what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to go through um, the types of charts that uh, we often use and I'll go through sort of the, you know, the pros and the cons of why to use those charts as well. Um, so starting with uh, your regular bar chart, the trusty bar chart. So um, pros for bar chart is they are easy to understand and it's clear to see trends as well. So even if you see here, you've got these numbers are, are very similar, but you can actually see, you know, the orange one here is taller or the blue one here is taller. Um, so it's, it's great to see these clear trends between them and the comparison between numbers is also uh, really easy with bar charts. Um, cons, they're not the most visually engaging. As I said earlier, you do have to get um, a bit creative with them if you want them to, to look, you know, really exciting. Um, and then also they're not as clear as line charts to use when comparing multiple data sets. Um, so to use these, I would use them if you want to show a clear trend or accuracy in your data. Um, and also I'd use them if, if you're creating an infographic um, which has lots of different types of data sets, then you know it's great to put a bar chart in there. And the great thing is you can stretch them, you can have them tall or you can have them wide. Um, or as we've seen before, you can have them as bands or circular. So there's quite a lot you can do with them. Um, and if you and then when not to use, maybe if you wanted a visually cutting edge infographic, 
just don't use too many of them you know just mix it up a bit with other other types of charts if you can so next we're looking at the um fan chart here so these are the pros are they're visually visually uh, quite striking um they produce nice geometric shapes for engaging layouts and these are easier to compare bars than the radial bar charts um the cons on this are the outer um wedges here are actually uh although they're although although they're similar in size because they're on the outer they seem much bigger than the than the smaller ones um, and it does take time to interpret these as well so i would use these if you need more visual impact than a bar chart for example um, and also use if you want to ranking in order of size and um, i wouldn't use them if this is something where you just need a quick interpretation of the numbers so um, maybe not best for that so moving on to the radial uh, bar charts. So um, here, these are these are quite visually striking again, and these are great for um, engaging page layouts as well. And especially if you're working within editorial, um, you can you can move these around and you can have them as different shapes, and you can work the editorial around them quite nicely. Um, so it works well for that. Um, they are quite hard to interpret as well. Um, and it's hard to compare the bars accurately, especially due to the distortions as they as they sort of curve around. So again, you've got this, uh, this the numbers here. In fact, you've got 2.6 here on the inner circle and 2.2 on the outer circle, although this looks bigger. So if interpreting the data accurately is important, then this is not the one to use. Um, so I would use it, um, I mean, I've, I think I've just said this, but if visual impact is important, then um, more important than uh, comparing the data, then use it, and also use it for ranking the size and order, and don't use it if it's if clear comparison between numbers is needed. So um, pie charts. So these are great and effective at showing a proportion or percentage of a whole amount. Um, visually, they could be quite attractive and they are very easy to understand as well um, it is difficult to see trends if you have you know high charts next to each other if you've got multiple ones then it's hard to compare the data that way it's just easier to compare the data from sort of a, a pie chart and all the data within that as a whole um, and it the, another con to uh, pie charts is you can't really display negatives um, with this so minuses so um, when to use, use when you're talking about a whole, when you're talking about 100% and um, use them if you're looking for something that will quickly engage people as well. Like I said, really easy to read. Um, try not to use if you want to compare lots of segments as well. So if you've got lots of data points within a pie chart, um, it might be difficult to read um, those subtle differences. So the Sankey diagram, so um, these are used to effectively show flows and trends um, and they really reflect the big picture of what's going on as well. Um, and now these can be really visually striking, um, but they also can be quite difficult to read sometimes if you're not sure what you're looking at. Um, so, and especially if there's lots of data points within that as well, they can be quite overwhelming when you see lots of you know, lots going on and they're quite hard to read. So I would use when we to show transfers, uh, flows and connections between different groups. But if a quick understanding of your data is really needed, um, maybe that's not the one because they do take time sometimes to work out. But again, it depends on, you know, what, how many data set, how many data points you've got within your, your data set. Uh, um, you know, really can be quite attractive to these ones and look really engaging on a page. Um, so then we come to um, bubbles and shapes and pictograms and icons. Um, so this is something that can be really engaging as well. Um, shapes can uh, reflect the subject matter um, quite easily. So for example, you've got you know the people that we see here showing the different groups of people. So you know icons are a great way of showing things. And if you can make the sizes relevant as well, then that's fantastic. Um, 
then it's good and it's it allows for flexible and dynamic layouts as well. Um, the cons to this is that they are not as uh, precise as you know bar charts, for example. Um, so I would use if you're looking for something that's visually quite impactful, um, and but not not for if you want to make really precise um, comparisons. And then we have tree maps as well. So tree maps are great for a you know a flexible design. You can squash them and you can pull them about, and you know they generally, no matter how, where you pull them, they'll they'll stay um, in pro. So everything is still relative to each other. Um, so that can be great for designers if you're you're working to you know complex layouts. Um, they are a pleasant way of presenting values. Um, and you can fit a lot of data within tree maps, but obviously it depends on what the size of your page is or your, you know, your web page or whatever you might be using it for. Um, they can be hard to label if you've got lots of small numbers, they can get quite difficult. Um, and if, if you do label them um, and you've got lots of small numbers, they can look quite uh, unpleasant as well. Um, then you've got here, you've got a circular packing uh, tree map on the right, which is also great if, um, you, you wanted to display, you know, different ways to show um, groups as well. Um, so that's that's a nice way of doing it using that. Okay, then now we've got area graphs as well. So area graphs are great. They show quantity over time, and they reveal um, trends. And these are great for for looking at trends over times. Um, they're more striking than a line graph as well, which is just sort of a single line. These are sort of filled in with that, as you can see, like the orange showing the full area. Um, they are hard. If you've got multiple uh, data on top of each other, it is hard to show these multiple data sets. And as you can see here, sort of it's going up and down, but it's hard. you kind of get lost. So again, also, if you wanted to use something, and this is sort of on the fly with people to understand this quite quickly, maybe not the best way, maybe you should go to more to a line graph. Um, so when to use to show to show precise quantities over time, to show trends in relation to another variable. Um, when not to use is when comparing multiple data sets that overlap. Um, now similar to what we've just looked at, but these are stacked area graphs. So these are great for showing several quantities over time. Um, visually striking and they, they uh, pretty striking compared to line graphs again because they're sort of filled in rather than just these these uh, light lines. Um, now the negatives on this is although the overall trend is clear, it is hard to see each data set and what the numbers are with that because of how they're stacked. So they can be hard to read sometimes as well. So um, these are ones that we would use if the overall trend is important and. It, but the inner layers that you see are less important, um, and also use if you wanted something, you know, where you could you could have a lot of colour on the page as well. Um, I wouldn't use if quantities need to be comparable, so I would use a line graph instead. Um, and here it is, the line graph. So, as we've said, you know, prons, the prons, sorry, the pros that make it uh, more effective for comparing several trends over over time, as you see here at the bottom. Um, but just because they, they are generally these light lines, they're not going to be as visually engaging and striking as they, you would with um, other charts such as the area graph. Um, so when to use it would be if we were to compare several trends um, in the most accurate format. And um, you know, often you get this in formal and academic work as well because it's just clear and easy to see. Um, when not to use is if we are looking for something that's really impactful um, and if that's more important than comparing then we wouldn't use it for that. Now we've got the scatter graph here. Um, so scatter graphs are great to show the relationship between two variables. Um, and they you can also include the line of best um, to show quick trends. Um, the cons is it's, it's hard sometimes to understand um, and to understand the correlation between you know, the, the, the X and Y coordinates. Um, so we would use that if we were looking for a, an effective way to show the correlation between two variables. Um, if there's no clear trend, unlike we've got here, we can see we're talking about gross national product and life expectancy, and you can see sort of as the gross national product 
goes up, life expectancy goes up and there's a clear trend. If there's not a clear trend within your data, um, probably not best to use. Um, and then we've got the bubble plot. So very similar what we just saw, but this is then adding another variable on there. So in this, we're talking about population. So same sort of data sets for adding population on. So um, this again, it's, you know, the cons on here is it might not, it is quite hard to understand to, to see the correlation. And if, if here, as you see, we use this sort of this transparency, if we didn't do that, it would have been hard to see what those numbers are behind. Um, so when to use is to use, if you're looking for a very effective way to show a relationship between three variables, um, um, if uh, interactive users can roll over these numbers on um, things like inter interactive um, uh, infographics where the numbers sort of pop up, then these can be great for that. Um, so something like these complex, then that's the time to use them. Um, when not to use them is when informal infographics or data is to be read really quickly. So, um, so that's kind of with the charts. Now, also we, at times we have to visualize data which is uh, not quantitative. So um, when we do that, if we did look at a quant quantitative data, so for example, here we have Tom is 10% taller than Harry, and we can clearly see that Tom is a bit taller with these two bars. If it was quality, qualitative data, we don't have that 10% and we say something like, you know, Tom dresses more casually than Harry. This is when you can do it with illustration or iconography or pictograms. Um, so that's a good way of doing it. So don't always think that, you know, with, that it always has to be hard data that you have it, you can, with numbers, you can have qualitative data as well. Um, so then just looking at best practices as well. Um, so colour, so colour theory is, you know, obviously it's it's great to have colour and we're often um, limited by brand guidelines, um, but try and keep things as, as simple as possible, lest you, you know, to use tints um, with your colour and also remember that colour um, is a form of communication too. So you've got here with your, you know, the, the ticks and your crosses, if you're green and you're red. Um, if you are, are using colour, try to use complementary colour as well, so it doesn't distract anything. So here you can see the tints, which work nicely, or you've got colours which complement each other. Um, so just try and keep it quite simple and not too many. If you have got large data sets and you need lots of, you know, to, to display it with either you haven't got enough, you can't use enough tints or there's not enough colours, then you can use patterns as well, and that's another great way of showing the difference between it. So think, you know, colours that, colours that go really well, not too many. Um, as a rule, we tend to use no more than three. Um, use your tints. When you're using tints, don't, you know, don't go from 100% to 95% to 90%. Give them some slight differences, you know, so from 100% to 75% tint to 50%. And then for anything else, then you've got your patterns as well. So you, and patterns can be obviously anything you like. So just some examples here to use is the hash lines, the waves, or or the dots. Um, avoid using colours which uh, clash. So I've just put some up here, which um, if you're colour blind, this would make it quite diff difficult to see. So just to be aware of that as well. And again, you know, depending on brand guidelines, it's not always easy, um, but just try and keep your, your colours um, away from sort of the, these groups that you see in front of you. Um, hierarchy as well, looking at hierarchy, use natural increments like, you know, fives and tens and fifteens rather than threes, nines, you know, so it makes it really easy. Um, and also with, with like charts, try and start at zero as well. It's not always going to be um, possible with, with things, but try and start your charts at zero as well, or it does distort the data. Um, keys and legends, if you've got a large data set or there's lots of labelings such, such as you see here, then use keys on there, you know, so then, and again, use colour to pull it out um, and do it that way rather than having it all labelled, otherwise it would just get messy and you won't understand it. Um, when looking at ranking, um, this really, I guess with anything, it's sort of logic going from small to big or this here going from, you know, clockwise as well. So start pie chart at, at your zero here at your 12 o'clock and go clockwise round. 
and then fonts as well pull out your information that you want people to see with your font so if the numbers are what is important then you know use but embolden them or make them a different color or do something there that just makes them a bit different so you can see the difference um, so in conclusion to all of that um, firstly get credible data set um, make sure you know that, that you're true to the data as well um, find the story within your your data look for those interesting facts look for the context around it and once you've got that you can build upon that um, define your audience and know who you're talking to position that infographic or that data set towards them and what they would like to see and, and that connect with them um, and then organize your data as well make sure it make sure that it that it sits right on the page you know there should be a hierarchy of almost like a a pyramid ta tailing down where you've got your hero information at the top and then the less important as you go down um, and then choose the right uh, charts or icons um, or even illustrations as well to visualize your your data um, and then finally get creative have fun with it um, you know so once you've once you sort of got all of that then you know as you saw that saw at the beginning then yeah, just really go to town on it. But just remember, this is a language where you want people to see clear differences. You want to, you want it where people can you know understand this quickly, um, and you really want to get your message uh, across to them. This is a this is a communication tool. Um, so um, that's it. That's the end of my presentation. So um, thank you very much. I hope that was uh, helpful to you. Um, I'm just going to have a look now. I don't know if there's any questions. I'm just going to have a quick look to see if there's anyone there has got any questions, or if you have, please please send them across. Um, let me have a look. Okay, so let me have a quick look here. Okay, so I have this one here from Martin. Um, it says, Dear Adam, thank you for your presentation. Is there a specific software you would recommend to manipulate data, data with accuracy while maximizing, maximizing creative freedom? Um, personally, I mean, I, because of my editorial background and um, I use InDesign a lot, so I will start with Illustrator and I will put my, my data sets in there, whether that's from, you know, it start, usually starts with Excel or some sort of PDF or something, but I'll, I'll put my data into um, Illustrator, but then I will take it out of Illustrator and I'll put it into InDesign. Um, now there's, I think once you put it into InDesign, it allows you a lot more flexibility to move it around and to change it. So there's sort of lots of tips and tricks and maybe, you know, I'll do something another day that sort of shows how you can how you build infographics within you know from Illustrator to InDesign and the reason I use it InDesign is because of that flexibility where I can just sort of stretch things and all the all the labeling stays together and I can move it around and I could you know change the page and you know just even with style sheets you can do quite a lot as well so um, personally I, I use uh, InDesign for it but it always starts in in Illustrator. Um, What else do we have here? Excuse me. I've got here from Ashley Davey. So any more examples from presenting quality data? I don't have anything else in, in here. Um, but um, again, if you have a look at our Behance page, which I showed up the front, and again, we can share that address after this webinar. Um, there, are, there are examples there, so you can have a look on how, how we usually deal with that. Um, so, and then is this document available for download? There are many helpful notes that are hard to write down. Um, I will I will share a version of this afterwards as well. So I believe after this, there's going to be a, a um, an email that will come around to you guys. Um, and it, I think it will be in there. Um, so, so yeah, or, or it, will, it will come through a little bit later, but there'll be a, there'll be a, a version of it, yeah. Um, okay, this one is from Matters. Hi, Matters. So it says, Adam, in your opinion, how would you take on an infographic for big data? Oh, God, that's a that's a good question. Um, 
Now, we've done lots of um, guidelines for uh, big sort of corporate companies. And one thing, you know, when doing guidelines is um, it's hard to, to define, you know, how big a data set is going to be. So, um, you know, where do you stop? And it can just keep going and keep going. I think we've, you know, what we're looking at here with infographics and data visualization, we're, we're not actually looking at big data. We're looking at small data. We're looking at big data is kind of funneled through and filtered and what we should be looking at is that filtered data which I call you know small data and it can still still be a fairly big data set um, but not huge if it was a huge data set then um, I, I mean there's lots of different ways of doing it it just depends I mean interactive um, is generally how I would go if there's a huge data set and you want people to move around it then then what I would do is yeah I'd have something that's online that's that you can sort of manipulate and take your your own journey yourself. Um, okay, I hope that answered your question, Matas. Um, now, is there any book you would suggest to learn more about infographics and data visualization? Um, cool, and that's a good question as well. There's loads. Um, I think just have a look what's out there. I mean, we've got we've got lots of books on our shelves here. I think one thing to bear in mind as well is you know. It is graphic design, the rules around graphic design apply, apply to data visualization. All we're doing is problem solving here. So, you know, it's it's about, you know, you've got a message that you need to get across. And that that comes, you know, you want to be, you want to use fonts which are clear. You want to use colors which are clear. You want to use grid systems. You don't want things to be too long. So it, it really, the, you, you treat it the same as you would uh, any design project, really. Um, so don't just look at the, the books on data visualization, look at books on, you know, graphic design in general, because that, that will help. Um, what other questions do we have? So how much testing do you do with the effective of your visualizations? Is feedback given from external sources as well? Um, Yes and and no. Again, it depends on the projects. Um, sometimes when we've done visualizations, it, it depends on the audience as well. So if it's more um, B to C, we've done stuff which has to go into heavy testing. So um, we'll have a brief. We'll come back with okay, these are the different ways in which you can visualize your data. Then that will go into workshops, and it's you know it's been workshops whether it's in the UK or if it's globally or it goes up and down the country, and they have these different groups in. Um, I think I've probably been in the game a long time. I often know what the, the results are going to be because it, it, it's quite obvious once you sort of see it. But um, but we do test it at times, yeah. But also within the studio here as well. I mean, it's, you know, we've, we've got a studio here of about 12 people and it goes through most people to, to see if it all makes sense. Brilliant. And I think that's the uh, end of the questions. And we are getting close to um, 7 o'clock now. So um, I would like to thank BenQ for inviting me um, to this. I'd like to thank everybody else as well for, for watching. I hope it was of interest. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, good. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.